that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My entire lifetime, I can never remember a single political candidate campaigning on a platform of mercy. The American electorate has consistently supported leaders who promise to be tough on crime who vow to be uncompromising in executing the war on drugs, who support zero-tolerance policies in public schools and mandatory sentencing guidelines for judges. Mercy is not politically popular. The merciful get played. The merciful get taken advantage of. The merciful are enablers. The merciful coddle criminals. The only time it is ever politically expedient to be merciful is during an elected leader's final days in office. That's when a president or a governor executes their power to pardon. It's at the very end of their last elected terms when the backlash of the voting public and their financial backers no longer constrains them that political leaders dare to be merciful. Doing so earlier in their term of office is political suicide. When President Gerald Ford pardoned former President Richard Nixon one month into his term in office, he forfeited his political career. After he lost to Jimmy Carter in the 76 election, Gerald Ford disappeared into political obscurity. The truth is, mercy frightens us. We believe that punishment is a necessary deterrent to prevent people from doing bad things. It's a concept that we begin to internalize early in life. Last week, Pope Francis authorized parents to spank their children when they misbehave as long as they do it in a way that preserves their dignity. The objective is not to humiliate children, but to correct their misbehavior. We seem convinced that the aversion to pain is the primary motivator for good behavior. Mercy removes the threat of punishment. If people aren't made to suffer the consequences of the decisions that they make and the actions that they take, then there is no deterrence 
for misbehavior. If you commit the crime, you must do the time. That's one of the premises of our society. Hard-heartedness, not mercy, is what leaves us feeling secure. We don't want mercy. We want people to be held accountable. We want them to pay for the injuries that they've caused. We want them to suffer in proportion to the suffering that they have inflicted on others. Vengeance and the threat of retribution is what keeps us safe from harm. It's what prevents others from exploiting our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. If people believe that they can get away with it, they will take advantage of us. Vengeance must be sure and swift. But it turns out that hardness of heart is not a very effective deterrent. Homicide rates haven't fallen in states that reinstituted capital punishment. States without the death penalty have consistently lower murder rates. Children raised by controlling and punishing parents have higher rates of delinquency than children raised by supportive and affectionate parents. Zero tolerance policies in public schools haven't lowered incidences of violence. What they've done is create a school-to-prison pipeline. Criminalizing drug possession or distribution hasn't Lower drug use or addiction rates, a lesson that we should have learned by the failure of prohibition in the 1920s. What the war on drugs has done is expand our penal population from about 300,000 30 years ago to 2 million people today. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world and a disproportionate percentage of those inmates are people of color. Today we imprison a larger percentage of the black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. Today, we incarcerate a higher percentage of the black population than South Africa did during the height of apartheid. And yet, annual surveys conducted by the U.S. Health and Human Services Department routinely show that people of all colors use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. This week we're taking up a study of Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. In her book she points out that once you've labeled someone a felon, then the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, denial of educational opportunities, denial of food stamps and public assistance, exclusion from jury duty, all the old forms of 
traditional discrimination are suddenly legal again. We believe that mercy threatens the public safety, but our hard-heartedness actually makes our lives less secure. Even here in Christ's church, many of us have developed a theology that reflects our mistrust of mercy. We proclaim the good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we believe that our favor with God is sustained by our good works. For centuries, the church has used the threat of eternal damnation to frighten people into living obedient lives. If you divorce your spouse, if you marry outside of our religious tribe, if you fail to adhere to the fundamental beliefs of our creed, then we threaten you with excommunication. You will be banished from the Lord's table, cast out of fellowship with the communion of the saints and excluded from the saving grace of God. We like to sing about God's amazing grace, but the threat of eternal damnation lurks deep within our hearts, even here in the church of Jesus Christ. One of the fundamental theological questions that each of us must come to grips with is whether or not we believe in redemption. If we don't believe that God has the power and the will to redeem all people from aimlessness and sin, then by all means we are justified in withholding mercy. If God is without mercy, then we should be too. We are justified in throwing away the people who disappoint us, the people who betray our trust, who fail to honor their obligations, who do things that hurt people, who can get convicted of felony offenses. But if we believe that God has the power and the will to redeem all people from aimlessness and sin. If the parable of the Good Shepherd who leaves the 99 to go in search of the one is more than just a clever story, but a mandate for how we are to lead lead our lives, then no one is ever disposable. If we believe in redemption, then the number 77 must become a sacred number to us. How often should I forgive? As often as 70 times, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 seven times. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
Since mercy is not a value embraced in our culture, then how do we as followers of Jesus hold mercy at the center of our hearts? One of the most famous stories that Jesus told about mercy is a parable that's known to us today as the prodigal son. It tells the story of a young man who demanded his family's inheritance and then went off and squandered it all on self-centered living. When his money had dried up a severe famine set into the region where he was living and he became in want. He had no way to feed himself and no one would help him and so at last he decided to return to his father's home hoping to be taken on as a hired servant. But Jesus said, while he was still far off, while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. The father wasn't persuaded to show mercy because of the sincerity of his son's remorse or because of his promise to make amends or because of his plea to be treated as nothing better than a hired servant before any words had come between them. The father was moved by compassion. Mercy always flows from compassion. Compassion re- humanizes the people that we encounter. Instead of seeing them as failures or felons or adulterers or embezzlers, instead of seeing them and defining them by their misbehavior, Compassion redeems their humanity. Compassion means literally to suffer with. It moves us beyond sympathy and beyond empathy and inspires us to desire, to alleviate the suffering of another. Compassion allows us to imagine what another is experiencing. It gives us a glimpse of what life is like from their perspective. It enables us to consider the circumstances that have shaped the decisions and the actions that another person has taken. Mercy begins with compassion. Unlike hard-heartedness, It relinquishes our power over another. It sets aside our entitlement to retribution. It surrenders our claim to the moral high ground. 
instead of holding the threat of punishment over another, mercy invites us to stand with each other, to recover our shared humanity, to recognize that we are all redeemed from the sins of our past by the mercy of God. It is not politically popular, but it is one of the foundational tenets of the Christian faith. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Amen.